The management of erectile dysfunction uh, also happens to be urinary incontinence as well. Uh, I did an extra year of training in New York uh, after I went to residency at Columbia. So um, I guess it's my passion, my specialty, my interest. Uh, at the end of the day is, um, you know, my goal is always just to be able to provide information and uh, talk about options. Uh, and at the end of the day, whatever works for the patient uh, and their partner is, uh, is the best for me. Um, in that um, brochure, you'll find a bunch of um, information, a lot of which we talk about uh, in the pictures uh, here today. Uh, but obviously, if there's uh, any questions that come up, um, you can raise your hand and we can talk about it here, um, or we can wait till the end uh, for a question and answer. Uh, and at the end of the day, um, also, um, you know, you have my uh, contact information. You can always reach out to me if there's any um, questions that you have that either um, you didn't want to share or that you forgot about. Uh, I'll just also say that on the inside uh, left cover, there is um, a copy of what we call the SHIM score, the Sexual uh, Health Inventory for Men. Uh, this is a questionnaire that we use to help sort of stratify where a man is coming into for evaluation. Uh, we oftentimes um, repeat the testing uh, uh, or repeat the questionnaire throughout um, follow-up to sort of see how we're doing and how we're affecting change. You'll notice that the uh, scoring is from one to five, uh, with the five on each of the questions being uh, the more severe or more problematic uh, answer of each question, uh, such that if you look at the total score, uh, men that are somewhere in about seven uh, or less uh, is considered mild erectile dysfunction. Uh, men that are somewhere in the sort of eight to um, uh, 15 or 8 to 18 range, that's sort of intermediate, and then men that are above 18, uh, that's considered uh, severe. Please, please come in. No, no such thing, no such thing. Come on, hello, good to see you guys. All right, so, um, you know, uh, I think what we'll do is we'll sort of just jump in and uh, sort of go over our agenda for tonight. We're going to talk about um, sort of what is erectile dysfunction, what causes uh, erectile dysfunction. I always feel, and I think that most of your doctors probably also talk to as well, to say that erectile dysfunction really is a treatment health indicator, okay? Sometimes people refer to this as the canary in the coal mine, okay? Sometimes it takes a lot for a man to realize or to acknowledge that they have some erectile dysfunction, and that could be a sign of other medical ailments, okay, of other medical issues. And so we'll touch a little bit on sort of what else uh, can erectile dysfunction signify, what does, uh, what are the conditions we need to be aware of, uh, et cetera. We also know obviously there are medical conditions that cause erectile dysfunction, and we'll talk about some of those as well. Obviously, we're going to talk about some treatment options for erectile dysfunction, um, and uh, we'll talk about some, some questions and answers there. So at the end of the day, what is erectile dysfunction? I always see erectile dysfunction is, erectile dysfunction is a condition where a man does not have the quality of erection for the duration of time that they want. End of story, okay? If it's not good enough for you or your partner, then that's erectile dysfunction, and we need to take you and work with you at that level, okay? Like we said before with the SHIM score, one could have a lower score, one could have an intermediate or a higher score. That is all erectile dysfunction, okay? Some other people may say that's an inconsistent ability to achieve an erection rigid enough for penetration um, or only brief erections. Um, so this is what I think is important to say is Everyone here in the room made an extra effort to come in here to learn about it. But at the end of the day is there are millions of men across the country that suffer from erectile dysfunction. Okay, we know that because of the prescriptions that men uh, take for uh, oral medications what we'll talk about. Or also there's been a lot of health studies uh, of areas like the Massachusetts Men's uh, Health Study where they basically just ask questions and they say, sir, do you have erectile dysfunction? Sir, do you have erectile dysfunction? And they just take the data. And then the day, what they found is, actually even one in three men now experience some form of ED. Because ED is a symptom, because ED is how a man perceives it to be, ED for one person may be different from another person, but if a man answers that they have ED, we quantify it that way. Um, and uh, 
Also important things to know is that obviously even if you have erectile dysfunction, um, most often uh, men are still able to ejaculate. Most often men are still be able to father children uh, and, some, and uh, to orgasm as well, uh, but that the ED or the rigid erection is not as strong for them. Uh, so we know that um, uh, erectile dysfunction can be caused by many things. There can be devastating injuries that a man might suffer in a car accident, leaving injury to the brain or spinal cord. We know that diabetes and heart disease or coronary artery disease um, can be causes of erectile dysfunction. Uh, men that have surgery on their prostate, um, either for prostate cancer or for other benign uh, prostate conditions can be affected by erectile dysfunction. The blood vessels and nerves around the prostate go directly to the penis and can affect erectile function. And we also know that um, tobacco, uh, drugs, um, even alcohol um, can cause erectile dysfunction. But then importantly, I bring up this about medications. There are medications that your doctors may have put you on, which are medications that are important for your body that may have a cause or a side effect of erectile dysfunction. We'll talk a little bit about that and, and why that happens. End of the day is we always want to make sure that men are taking the medications they're prescribed. If there's a better one available, we obviously can, can change to that. But at the end of the day is I want to be able to help support um, the issues at hand, uh, making sure that you still are safely on, on the medications that you're prescribed. Okay, so this gets a little bit to the idea. I talk sometimes that erectile dysfunction is the canary in the coal mine. Because at the end of the day is, the blood vessels of the penis are significantly smaller than the blood vessels of the heart or the blood vessels of the brain, okay? So erectile dysfunction sometimes can be a systemic sign of issues with the heart or the brain, okay? Men that are diagnosed with erectile dysfunction um, are at risk for heart issues for strokes. And in fact, men that have erectile dysfunction that go on for further treatment are evaluated and found to be uh, at these higher risks, okay? Men that have erectile dysfunction may also have suffered heart attacks, okay? Men who have erectile dysfunction may have also suffered from diabetes as well. And so all of these are important things to be talking with your primary care doctor, with your urologist, and with your partner about, because at the end of the day is, we want things to be healthy and safe for the man at all days of their life, okay? Now, for, especially with regard to uh, erectile dysfunction, we talk about age, Yes, as men get older, the blood vessels to their penis are smaller and less, um, uh, have, a, have a less um, effect of bringing blood to the penis. But that's not to say that there are men that have um, great sexual lives as they age, okay? So age on its own should not be seen as a problem where, okay, I'm just this old, I can't move past this, this is just what it is. If a man and their partner would like support, Myself and others are always happy to. We talked about uh, high blood pressure. We talked about coronary artery disease. Uh, those can be risk factors for um, erectile dysfunction. Uh, men that take medications for depression, such as SSRIs, or medications may have a side effect that cause a decreased libido and cause erectile dysfunction. End of the day, this is another um, group of men that need to be on the medications that they're on, but I need to, myself and others need to help support them to be able to work with their erectile function. Antihypertensive medications, men that have high blood pressure, that are put on blood pressure medications, well, at the end of the day, those medications lower the blood pressure, which is perfect. That keeps the man safe. But it also decreases the blood that's available for the penis to be able to have an erection. So oftentimes, men tell me, I was started on the blood pressure medication, and I soon had erectile dysfunction after that. I stopped the medication, and my erectile function got better. So first thing is, always stay on your medications always stay on the medications your doctor prescribed you, but let your doctor know. Let your uh, primary care doctor know, and if you need a referral for that, there are things we can do to help support your erectile function while you're safe on medications. And then, um, obviously, anything that you can do in terms of stopping smoking, uh, decreasing alcohol, and being more active will help uh, total body health, total body blood flow, and uh, erectile function. Um, Again, as we talked about before, um, age on its own uh, has been shown to be a risk factor for erectile dysfunction. Uh, we know also that erectile dysfunction uh, increases as men age. Now also that's sometimes not 
always fair because as men get older, they also have other medical issues. And so it may not be the age itself. It may be uh, a little bit about, um, about the medical issues. Um, OK, uh, diabetes and hypertension. Um, we talked about that coronary artery disease, um, erectile dysfunction can be a uh, risk factor for that. Well, the same thing as diabetes. Men that come to present with erectile dysfunction uh, are always evaluated, in, at least in the urology office, with urine testing to look for glucose in the urine. That could be a risk factor for diabetes. One of my patients that, in fact, I saw uh, earlier today had come into the office for an evaluation had blood glucose found in his urine. He then saw his primary care doctor, was diagnosed with diabetes. He actually, unfortunately, also was found to have an EKG or a heart monitor change, which then led to other evaluation techniques. And actually, he has gone to see more specialists in the last uh, month and a half than he ever saw in the five years before. Now, he is doing better today because of that. But at the end of the day, it's the evaluation coming into the office, looking in to erectile dysfunction that really opened up his eyes as well as his partner's eyes in helping to uh, learn more about his own health. Um, diabetes, uh, men on, uh, with diabetes uh, tend to fail oral medications earlier than men without diabetes because the diabetes affects the blood vessels in a different way. Okay, diabetes, as we know, uh, puts blood glucose molecules throughout the entire body, okay, throughout all the blood, uh, red blood cells and through all the blood vessels. And so the, the blood glucose affects the arteries uh, to make it so that they cannot do the work that they need to do. Coronary artery disease, on the other hand, that's the uh, understanding of plaque in the blood vessels that you think about, that affects blood vessels uh, as well. And so both of these conditions uh, really, um, really uh, increase your risk for erectile dysfunction and vice versa. Erectile dysfunction can be a, uh, can be a, a harbinger for, for what's going on underneath. Okay, um, again, here's some numbers. Maybe this helps to, to drive it home, but you know, with diabetes, you have uh, over a 4% uh, risk for increase in erectile dysfunction. Uh, peripheral vascular disease, uh, 2.6. Um, prostate disease are there most likely because those men were treated for prostate cancer, um, men with cardiac problems, uh, et cetera. Um, and so again, just to touch on prostate cancer, um, I'm sure that we all know uh, someone who has, uh, who has been diagnosed and survived prostate cancer, which is amazing. Uh, prostate cancer, whether it's radiation therapy or the surgical removal of the prostate, uh, can affect the blood vessels and nerves uh, around the prostate, uh, which, um, which uh, then lead to the penis and uh, can, can cause erectile dysfunction. So again, it's another way uh, that, that, that erectile dysfunction can be caused. Always a point, we always make sure, we always tell every patient at any opportunity, if you are smoking cigarettes, please let us know. There are ways that we can help to, uh, decre to get you to correct um, professionals and support staff to be able to cut smoking. Because at the end of the day, smoking is not good for any part of your body but specifically uh, will affect uh, your erections and, and penile blood flow. Um, and so I always think that's an important um, for us when we talk about erectile dysfunction is to talk about how does the normal penis work. And by knowing how the normal penis works, we can see how problems in uh, the penis with regard to diabetes or um, hypertension or other issues can cause can cause problems there. So in a normal, well-functioning penis, you know that the penis always has two parts. It has the um, corpora cavernosa, or the spongy tissue of the penis, which fills with blood to make the erection, and has the urethra below, OK? When an, er when an erection is made, the blood flow uh, increases within the arterial aspect of this corpora tissue to really increase there, and also starts the, erect the erection process, such that at maximal uh, erection, these blood uh, vessels are completely full and they've really brought all the blood into this spongy tissue. I also want you to note these veins that are on the outside, they are also compressed, okay? So the veins are closed. So with, when, a, when a normal healthy erection happens, the erection both increases these chambers, but also closes these veins. This prevents the blood from leaving the penis, okay? You may 
uh, yourself, or you may have heard about men, some men have problems getting an erection, okay? They have a problem getting an erection because the arteries themselves are not open enough to release the blood, okay? Some men have a hard time maintaining erections. Well, in that situ, I apologize. In that situation, these veins are not closing properly. Sometimes that's an, yeah, I'm gonna play this whole game. Uh, sometimes that's an inherent issue in the veins itself, okay? There is a condition known as venous leak, okay, where men can have essentially varicose veins within the penis where the veins don't close properly. Because of that, the blood drains out of the penis, even if they're able to get strong erection tissue and good blood into the penis. And those men uh, might say, you know, the erectile dysfunction used to be work with oral medications, but now it doesn't work. Well, it doesn't work is because the degree that the medicine's able to help, the natural tissue has decreased such that the veins are now draining out. Okay, sometimes I think about it like a lake. Okay, I grew up fishing in the Midwest, so you have a nice lake. You get a nice lake by having a good river runoff to fill that lake and having a closed dam on the backside. Okay, if that river doesn't have good drainage, you're never going to get the erection. Okay, if that Oh, sorry, are you ever, that lake's never going to fill up or you'll never get the erection. If that dam is broken on the back, you're going to lose the erection. Okay, and so at some point in time, you may not be able to have enough river inflow, enough, not enough blood flow inflow to maintain the erection that way. And so these are all things that men come with, uh, their own personal experiences that help to um, understand from a biologic side what's happening. Okay, and, and the evaluation that I do, in addition to talking to a man and getting a history, sometimes I'll employ a penile Doppler ultrasound. What that does is it allows me to measure the arterial and measure we're going to go all night. Uh, measure the venous issues with the blood so that I can see, does this man, from what I see in the penile tissue, is this a pure arterial issue? Is this a pure venous issue, or is there a mix of both? That helps to determine what the best treatment option is, OK? So now we're going to talk a little bit about some treatment options that exist, OK? Uh, again, this is sort of to, to get the memory going, to get the juices flowing, so that you know, if you have questions that come up, uh, I always want to be able to hear them. So, oral drug therapy. I think everyone knows or has heard about Viagra, Cialis, Levitra. At the end of the day, all of these medications work very similarly. Okay? All these medications have the same root drug. All these medications work at the arterial level of the penis to relax the arteries to allow more blood into the penis, okay? What that does is it allows the erection chambers to fill a little better, which is allows the erection to be a little stronger, okay? Now, Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, they all have in themselves some different dosing, okay? And some different timing. Viagra was the first medication on the market. They got the lion's share of the um, prescriptions. But the way that Viagra is, is you have to take that on an empty stomach a few hours before you want to have sexual intercourse, OK? Cialis came to market, and they said, wait a second. How can we be different than Viagra, right? It's still the same active drug. And so with Cialis, you don't need to have um, an empty stomach, OK? And so you can have had a meal and things like that. So it changes a little bit about how it's dosed, et cetera. And then Levitra, um, some uh, can work a little faster uh, than some of the others. And so again, these are the, the three big players on the market. There are generic versions uh, available for Viagra as Sildenafil, uh, for Cialis as Tadalafil, and Levitra still is not uh, available generic, at least in the United States. Yes, sir? I'm sorry to interrupt. Please. You say an empty stomach. Yeah. Is that just food, or is that liquid? Or food. Uh, good question. It's mostly. Whether it be water, of course, you're not supposed to drink alcohol. <laughs> we got to be honest, right? We don't. Uh, and so at the end of the day, it really means just food, okay? Uh, the more empty the stomach it has to do with absorption, okay? So a lot of medications, as you know, are taken by the mouth and absorbed in the stomach, okay? So there's better absorption when there's not food in the stomach. And so, but that's a great question. Uh, oral drugs are great, oral drugs are easy. Can write a prescription, patient takes the medication. If it works, perfect. If 
it doesn't work, then we need to talk about what is the next step. More importantly, though, there's also side effects with these medications, okay? These medications help to sometimes can drop the blood pressure, okay? That can cause dizziness. That can cause some visual changes. Sometimes that causes upset stomach, depending if the medication uh, needs to be taken with an empty stomach or not. And there is an absolute contraindication to these medications and men that take... Um, Nitrates for chest pain. Men that take nitrates for chest pain uh, cannot take these medications because that together they can cause an unsafe drop in blood pressure. Okay, so if there is a man that sees a cardiologist, you need to make sure that this is a safe medication for you to take. All right, so that's an important part. Sir, please have a seat. We can get you a, a brochure over. Um, okay, so we always talk about. All right, so. If oral medication doesn't work, what are some additional options? Well, another very good option is something called penile injection therapy. Penile injection therapy takes a version of the oral medication and combines it with two other drugs, so a total of three drugs that is able to be injected into the shaft of the penis to help induce an erection. That's beneficial because you don't have to worry about taking the pill, so the side effect profile of the dizziness and headaches is completely out of Men that can't take um, nitrates for chest pain can take this medication because it's, again, focused within the penis. Okay? Again, if oral medication is not strong enough for, for a man and they feel that even on oral medication it's not working as well, injection therapy can be modulated, can be, ad can be adjusted to, for able to help a man. Now, obviously this medication needs to be injected into the penis, okay? So there's no getting around that. Either the patient or their partner needs to be involved in that process. Um, when I do my Doppler ultrasounds and I'm in evaluating the man's um, penile vascular blood flow, I will often give an injection of this medicine to induce an erection. That helps for two reasons. One, if a man is able to get an erection with that medication, that's a great sign. Okay, we're able to use that as positive encouragement for moving forward. Additionally, it helps me with a starting dose for the medication. With an oral medication, I can feel very safe giving a patient even the top dose of Cialis or the top dose of Viagra. However, once you talk about injection therapy, we need to talk about having an erection that lasts longer than you'd like. Okay? The goal of injection therapy, the goal when you work with a doctor is to induce an erection that lasts about 35 or 40 minutes, okay? Beyond that, we want to make sure the erection goes away. If someone were just to give a, 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 a needle and a medicine and say, go for it, there's a risk that someone might take too much medication. Taking too much medication might make a great erection for that 35 or 40 minutes, but can become unsafe. And so that's why if you're doing injection therapy, you need to be working with a doctor or a doctor's um, team on this. And this is, again, a treatment option uh, that uh, myself and other doctors uh, feel very comfortable using. Um, vacuum erection devices. Vacuum erection devices are a great non-medical option. Vacuum erection devices use basic science, basic vacuum technology with either a handheld pump or a bat I guess it senses me, or a battery-powered pump to be able to pull the blood into the penis. At the end of the day, those blood vessels are open. And so by using a vacuum and creating a vacuum system within the penis, it's able to pull the blood into the penis. The other benefit of a vacuum erection device is there is a constriction band that it can be placed on the base of the penis. That constriction band will help to prevent blood from leaving the penis. Okay, we talked about before with those veins that need to close. In some men that those veins aren't closing, that elastic band on the base of the penis can actually close off those blood vessels for the man. And so by using the vacuum erection device with or without oral medication, with or without injection therapy, this is the first treatment that also works specifically at closing those veins off from a mechanical way, okay? The injection therapy, it's possible to give yourself more medicine to be able to overpower that dam so that even if you have a really good a river, back to our analogy, that lake, that penis blood flow is gonna stay strong. But this is a great option that can be added with or without oral medication. Uh, you have to know how to use it. Uh, it's also important to know is that this band, when placed tight on the base of the penis, 
prevents the blood flow from leaving the penis, which is great. It also prevents ejaculation from passing down the urethra. So one, uh, a man and his partner need to be aware that if an ejaculation is an important part of sexual activity, that the band may need to be removed to allow ejaculation to occur. Okay, that's an important thing just to be aware of. Okay. Um, and then uh, insertable drugs or urethral suppositories, those of you that know that uh, we who have discussed this, I actually don't recommend this treatment. I'm a urethral reconstructive surgeon. I don't like the idea of anyone sticking something into their urethra um, that could possibly cause any trauma or damage. Um, additionally, the medication itself can be uncomfortable, uh, and so uh, this is something that I actually quickly pass over, but it is a treatment option that you may have heard of um, and may, may have even tried in the past. Again, um, you know, just to sort of round out um, all of the, the other options, another treatment option is a penile prosthesis. Uh, penile prosthesis uh, at one point in time was thought of as the, the last ditch, right? When nothing else works, we go to the penile prosthesis. You know, in my training and, and working with patients, really I bring penile prosthesis uh, up to the front because at the end of the day is my goal and the patient's goal is to have good, satisfactory intercourse when they want it the spontaneous intercourse. And so I introduced penile prosthesis in the beginning because for a lot of men, the idea of oral medication was fine. But the idea of injecting themselves is not something they're interested in, and that's okay. I never want you to feel like you have to do something to get an erection that you don't feel comfortable with, that you're not going to do. It doesn't make sense for me to prescribe you the medication. It doesn't make sense for you to fill the prescription if you're honestly not going to be able to do it. And so we should be able to move past that. Additionally, like we talked about with the arterial inflow and the venous closing, by using a penile prosthesis, we bypass that whole system. We no longer care about the blood flow to the penis. We're able to create a very stable erection on demand for the patient when they want. And so it, it does not need to use medications, not need to use injection therapy. It also should be mentioned that the penile uh, prosthesis um, here, the Titan penile prosthesis, this is covered by insurance. Okay, A lot of people might have seen that with their insurance policies, oral medication or injectable medication uh, is, um, is not covered. Uh, penile prosthesis uh, is, is available under insurance plans, and, and I've worked with patients in the past to be able to, to help uh, navigate that insurance uh, process. Additionally, um, the penile prosthesis uh, allows a spontaneous erection, okay? And I think that at the end of the day, the goal of all of this is to be able to have spontaneous intercourse, okay? And so another positive of the penile implant, different than the vacuum erection device, different than the oral medication, different than the injectable therapy, is that you can have an erection when you want, okay? You can have an erection for five minutes, I tell patients, or five hours, because at the end of the day, when it's inflated, you can have it for up as long as you want. The penile prosthesis is inflated and deflated with this device that's placed in the scrotum. It does not affect sensation on the penile skin. It does not affect ejaculation if you, are, if you ejaculated before the procedure, and it does not affect urination. Okay? It really is just stabilizing and supporting those areas of the penis that I like to jump through. Here, the penile prosthesis is placed through these spongy tissues during a surgical procedure that lasts about an hour. Okay? That procedure is done under general anesthesia. Okay? And so at the end of the day, the goal is to be able to help at any possibility. And so what I want to make sure is that you have all the information, you've heard about all the information, and that, oh, this is a picture there, um, about, um, about, about the prosthesis itself. And so, again, uh, this is a comment about the insurance there, and um, there's obviously always ways to learn more. Um, and let's just, we'll move it to here. So, um, I, I want to really take the most amount of time to be able to answer questions or to be able to talk more about something that's important to, to everyone here. Um, and uh, you know, whether that's here uh, in this room, whether we continue our conversation uh, in, the, in the office, uh, in, the, in my office, um, I just want to be able to be available for you. So I'll say, is there any questions that anyone, easy, perfect. Okay, okay uh, in our, our meeting at uh, your office. Yeah. You said it, it's sort of like if you, if you don't use, you lose. Right. That's a great question. Is there any way to lessen those effects 
Right. So, uh, like work, work, working toward the uh, pump up. Right, the penile prosthesis. So that's a great question. At the end of the day is penile tissue is meant to expand and contract. You saw with that picture of that spongy tissue, healthy penile tissue stretches, okay? If the erections are not frequent, that penile tissue can become fibrotic, okay? Fi fibrotic penile tissue can contract, okay? Fibrotic uh, penile tissue can lose length. There are men that, have, that sometimes describe that since developing erectile dysfunction, they feel that they've lost length. They're not wrong. That's completely true. And so your question is, is, is says, what can we do to help maintain as much length as possible? The goal is uh, the best way to maintain length is whatever gives you the best erection. Okay, so a, one option would be a vacuum erection device, which can help to pull blood into the penis, that can help to get that blood filled up into those chambers. Okay, but for some men, they may not be able to get an erection strong enough with that vacuum erection device. And with that, we sometimes talk about combining injection therapy with that, but the other point becoming, if you're concerned about losing length and if the oral medication and the injection medication does not work for you, then maybe that's something where we talk about something like a penile prosthesis where at the time, in the operating room, the penis is measured, and I essentially have a set of, like a shoe store, I have a set of sizes from small all the way to large with additions either in between, and your size right at that area. So that length is not lost, length is maintained uh, and moving forward. But good question. Thank you. <laughs> yes? Can um, erectile dysfunction, not being able to um, have an erection for a long, long time, like you said. Mm -hmm. And that also caused pain in the um, testicles? Is this, um, I would say that erectile dysfunction on its own doesn't cause pain in the testicles. However, um, it is in the general area, and sometimes the prostate could be blocking, or there could be, you know, there could be some pressure on the testicles with ejaculation. Uh, and so that might be with referred to that, since we know that with erection co sometimes comes ejaculation. And so if there's not good uh, erections, then sometimes the, uh, the backup of the sperm, which is being produced by the testicles, may cause the discomfort that you mentioned. So, good question also. Oh, sorry, sir, yes? Can you talk more about how the, uh, the implant, how you operate it? Sure. No, that's a great question. That is a great question. That was my question also. All right. Everyone's got good questions. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Thank you so much. All right. Good question. So, so the penile prosthesis the inflatable penile prosthesis we actually um, refer to as the three-piece inflatable prosthesis, okay? Three pieces, two that the patient cares about, three the doctor cares about. The, two pa the three pieces are the reservoir, which I consider sort of be the water tower, okay? That's placed underneath the muscle um, of, the, of the abdominal wall there. Then you have the penile prosthesis, which is this paired uh, inflatable cylinders within the penile shaft, which again replaces that spongy tissue within the penis, and then the pump which sits into the scrotum. Through a single incision, we're able to place all of the components of this device. And then once uh, healing uh, has happened, the penile prosthesis is manipulated by squeezing a pump which sits in the scrotum next to the testicle, okay? And because this penile prosthesis is sort of a space uh, saver, in the beginning, one may need to pump it five or six, maybe seven or eight times to get to maximum capacity. But as that tissue relaxes over time, you may actually be in, uh, inflating more as the penile tissue relaxes underneath the prosthesis. Uh, next to the um, penile prosthesis is also a deflation button, okay, which is then uh, gently squeezed, and the prosthesis is brought down to the flaccid state. Brings up a question also is I have patients that uh, walk around in the gym uh, after the pool or the shower, and they feel very comfortable without people knowing that they have a penile prosthesis, okay? And then additionally, um, they feel very comfortable being able to manipulate uh, the penile prosthesis. Exactly, what is pumped in there? This is the pump right there, and this, that's what it's... I mean, what is pumped in? What is pumped? Uh, fluid from this water tower area there. So again, based on the size of the implant, underneath the abdominal wall sits a reservoir that holds that fluid so that in a flaccid state, the fluid is in the reservoir and the penile implant is flaccid. When it comes time to, to pump the prosthesis up, pressing on that pump diverts fluid from the reservoir 
into the prosthesis to allow the rigid erection. And then during deflation, the fluid is moved back to the reservoir. Yes, sir? This process, this operation, how long will it take, and what is your recovery time? You mean the surgical procedure itself? Um, so, you know, first thing I will say is every patient is different, okay? Uh, the surgical procedure itself, depending on um, the degree of uh, fibrosis or the degree of scarring of the penis, is somewhere between, you know, an hour to two hours in the operating room, done under general anesthesia. Depending on what other medical conditions you have, that can be performed in um, one of our surgery centers or within the hospital, depending on what is the safest for your doctor uh, to do. Okay, there are also some um, insurance uh, companies that prefer to have the procedure performed uh, in the hospital versus the surgery center. Uh, patients go home the same day, it's called an ambulatory surgery, okay? And then that's where the healing process begins, okay? At the end of the day is, this is surgery on the penis and scrotum. So the penis and scrotum will be very tender, will be very swollen, will be very bruised, okay? I think that many people uh, have not had a recent surgery on their penis or scrotum, and so there is a, um, a very difficult time in comparing how, how that's gonna feel, okay? And so as someone who also has not had recent surgery on their penis or scrotum, sometimes, I'll be honest, it may be difficult for me to tell you uh, exactly what it's gonna be like for you. Um, I will say that at the end of the talk, um, we will have uh, one of my patients come and describe a little bit about their healing uh, and their process, which will give you a little bit more of a personal approach. But then it is, there is a recovery time at home, okay? Um, and uh, there is a time where initially you're uh, uncomfortable at home, and then you are able to get up and move around the house, and then return to work depending on what you need to do at work. I will say in the beginning parts, I really want patients to be able to focus on just maybe sitting or at a computer. Heavy lifting or big issues, that way that could possibly uh, hit the penis or scrotum or also cause additional pain, we like to minimize uh, during that process. Um, but uh, you know, it, I would say for some patients, uh, it's on the order of a week or so. For some patients, it could be a few more weeks depending uh, on healing. Uh, and that obviously would also talk about time off from work. Uh, I will say that I've never had a, prob a patient have a problem with regard to paperwork for time off work for this surgery. Um, we have a very good staff at the, at the office, and so we can obviously help out with any paperwork that's required. I do also think it's very important, to, if you can, to have someone at home to help you, at least in these first few days, okay, in terms of, um, you know, making something to eat or helping you, you know, get to where you need to be. Because at the end of the day is we want you to be able to recover as best as possible. And that's not just time from the surgery. That's also being able to get up and do the things that you need to do. There was a question in the back? Yeah, Aaron, the uh, hernia, like Good question. Right, so that's a good question. If you have a hernia on just one side of the body, we'll, we'll perform the reservoir procedure on the other side, okay? If you had a hernia repair on both sides uh, of the body with mesh material, then there's a way that we can um, put the reservoir uh, on the other, other side of the hernia mesh, but still underneath the muscle to be safe for that. That's a very good question. Uh, as part of the evaluation in the office, we'll talk about previous surgeries that you've had uh, as well. But obviously, um, you know, you make sure you let uh, myself or, or someone else know what other surgeries you've had. So yes? If they have had surgery previously, yeah. you'll be able to pull the uh, surgery records? Sure. We always can, can, depending on where the surgery is performed, we always can reach out to different uh, hospitals or clinics to be able to get those records. Yes, sir. I have a question. The uh, implant, does that replace the spongy tissue? Good question. Next to it or inside of it? So it's a very good question. It's placed within the spongy tissue okay. such that oral medications and injections aren't needed because also they won't work. Okay, the reason why uh, penile prosthesis is able to give you that uh, erection uh, with, with the pumping procedure is because it replaces in that spongy tissue the erection uh, chambers. Okay, and so that's why it is um, relaxing and inflating within that same area, and that's why the erection is uh, a natural feel. That's why the erection is a natural look because it's within those, those, those chambers. So this procedure has been performed for, for over uh, 25 years at different formulations. I would say that the, the um, Titan uh, prosthesis uh, here uh, has been performed for over uh, 12 years as it stands right now. Um, they're really um, 
there really isn't any changes and modifications because it really is a, uh, a hydraulic system. It's the squeezing of the device that shuttles fluid from the reservoir there. There's always talk about an app-controlled or a magnet-controlled prosthesis, but at the end of the day, the last thing we want to do is have uh, some uh, hacker in, uh, in their basement <laughs> be able to be in charge of your erection. So I think for right now, we're going we're gonna to keep with uh, the old standard, if you will. Yes, sir? Can that, uh, those parts be damaged by... You got hit or you were in an accident? Good question. So um, the device itself is completely MRI compliant as well as also will not set off any uh, TSA information. I just add that as a corollary because you made me remember it. Um, now, uh, this device is in your penis. Uh, so if the, if the device was you know, inflated and, and one fell or if the device was inflated, it, it could pop or rupture, that's obviously possible, okay? Again, you know, because there is a reservoir component underneath the abdomen, if you, God forbid, were involved in a trauma, it could be injured. Now, I will say that this device uh, lasts about 10 years in its process that way. That's to say that the pump and the components after 10 years may not work as well, okay? At that point in time, they can be repaired, okay? So speaking to your question of if they are damaged, and, the, and the, the patient is still intact and it's just a tube with a pump that's damaged, that part can be fixed and repaired. Um, but I would say just in general, I guess, definitely for, force of sexual activity or general sort of moving around the world, uh, it would not be, would not be damaged there. That's a good question, though. Yes, sir? A limit to how many times you can pump that thing up? No, I mean, we use. <laughs> That's a very good question. Very good. Another reason why we don't have this app controlled. Uh, we don't want any explodings. Um, so, at the end of the day, is um, the pump, again, I, I would say that for an average user, after about 10 years, there may be some dysfunction within the pump. We call that pump dysfunction, not erectile dysfunction, because we've already fixed that. So, if you have that pump that's uh, maybe not working so well, that's probably the component of the device that's not going to work. In terms of over pumping, which uh, you had talked about exploding, that's actually not possible. Okay, as you inflate out there, there's only a fixed amount of fluid that can go in there. Okay, and it's tested in the operating room by um, me or your surgeon, and so we're actually able to make sure that all the components sit correctly and look correctly prior to any uh, use. No explosions noted. What if you want to fill your reservoir? You want to? <laughs> we can talk about that. <laughs> yes, sir. What is the actual fluid? It's saline. It's uh, completely sterile saline. And um, they're actually, in the operating room, there's a complete separate set of sterile saline that's used within this device that's different than sterile saline that may be used to either irrigate the wound or uh, for other parts of the device. So it's a completely separate closed system. So the fluid that's in the... Prosthesis. No, in oh. the... Um, reservoir. Reservoir. Yeah. Once it comes out, this is what inflates the penis. Exactly. So once it's out, when the penis is not erected, does the fluid just go back in it, the reservoir? It does. Um, under, above the pump, if you can sort of see, I know the, the penis is blocking it, uh, if it looks a little bit like a small snowman. So the bottom of the snowman, that's the actual pump part. The top part of the snowman, that's what deflates the prosthesis and sends the fluid to, from the prosthesis back up to the reservoir. So at the surgery, when they have the surgery, they're very sore around and on the penis. And the scrotum as well. And, okay, the scrotum as well. Uh, they can get around and, uh, and all still. Or well, well, you can have somebody to be able to do things for you or something like that. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to judge how... Well, I would tell how much I'll, pain or whatever they're going to be in or not be able to do. Well, that's a great question. I will say this is an outpatient surgery because when the patient gets home, they are able to do some things. Okay. Uh, you know, there are other surgeries that you may have which are called inpatient surgeries because there is some of the rehab process begins in the hospital. So while one is uncomfortable, for sure, okay, they are able to 
uh, move around. Now, I would obviously not schedule a marathon within the first few weeks uh, or any significant uh, cleaning of the garage or anything like that uh, because there is some healing that needs to happen. Um, but uh, in terms of how much additional supports one needs, I would say that it, you know, sort of, it's got to sort of see how it goes. I would want to make sure that someone wasn't relying on themselves to cook meals or things like that simply while they're uncomfortable. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Oh, I apologize. We're behind you. Uh, once the surgery is done, as far as urinating, do you have to have a catheter or a period of time? Or no. Something? Great question. Um, the way that I do this surgical incision, I don't place a catheter. Um, uh, after the surgery, so you go home being able to urinate the exact same way as you came in. If you'd like a catheter, I'm happy to put one in. Uh, not within the urine, no, because we don't, as you saw from the picture before, the incisions are all within the actual penile tissue. So we actually don't touch the urethra or get involved at all. So um, I'm always happy to give a catheter, but usually that's uh, never, never requested. Is it painful to urinate after the operation? So, so I think that goes to this question there. The urination process is the same as before. Because the penis is uncomfortable, there may be some soreness uh, about that. But actually, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, do, we'll give that question over to, uh, to, our, to our patient uh, who, who can talk more about that. Because I actually, I, I don't know the exact answer to that part. But you had a question, sir. Answered. Yeah. There you go. Teamwork. Same okay. One, there you go. We'll get, it, we'll get you up here. Stories of breast and plants. Right. Bursting and breaking. I guess that's mainly with silicone. Would there be an issue with the saline if there were some kind of leakage into the body? So that's a great question. If there was a break or a um, or an issue with the system, uh, the saline may leak out. I will tell you, having dealt with patients that have had problems with other prosthesis, both in training, fellowship, and today, just having patients that have already had the procedure performed by somebody else, it's not, uh, it doesn't lead to increased infection, it doesn't lead to increased pain. Uh, the amount of total fluid here is actually only about 125 um, mill milliliters or so. You're talking about okay. maybe four or five ounces. Sure. So really, someone knows that it's, that it's broken because it doesn't pump up right, not because they've got, God forbid, an infection. But it's not harmful to the body. Anymore. No, and that's why it's the sterile saline that's okay. used specifically in there. Mainly that's the silicone. Correct, anyway. yeah. We do not inject this with silicone. Okay. Don't put any silicone in your body, okay. sir. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Let's see. What is that, that thing made of? The, um, what is the device made out of? No. The reservoir. All the materials are made from a composite material of a derivative of, you know, sort of Gore-Tex type material, uh, and so it, it's all uh, it's all of that sort of material there. But it's no, there's no metal in it that sets off an MRI or TSA. Oftentimes, um, uh, you know, pa patients uh, are, as I said, are able to. Uh, you know, go around the gym uh, without any issues. The incision that I make uh, is uh, oftentimes uh, just on the base of the penis. There are different incisions that could be made based on other conditions that may need to be worked on. We didn't mention here, but there is a condition called Peyronie's disease that you may have heard of that can cause a curvature of the penis. Um, sometimes in the treatment options for uh, Peyronie's disease, you can fix the curvature, uh, but if someone else has erectile dysfunction there, then you may not be able to give them the erections that they want. And so, as I always discuss with patients, if we're going to go to the operating room under anesthesia, my goal is always to fix uh, all issues. So if someone has erectile dysfunction and Peyronie's disease, we try to fix them uh, at the same time. But if someone has Peyronie's disease or other conditions, it may require a different incision. Um, oftentimes, the incision is just at the base of the penis, which is usually covered by the man's hairline. Um, it's about three centimeters long and, uh, and heals very well. All, he, all sutures are dissolvable sutures, so there's no sutures that need to be removed uh, or need to come back to the operating room um, for that. Um, and as part of, just touch on this, while that healing process is going on, I always make it that that's where I have the most amount of visits that we'll have. Okay, we have it at about three or four days after, a week or so after that, a week or so after that. Really just to uh, make sure that everything is number one healing well, but also that we start teaching and start having a teaching process, okay? End of the day is my goal is if we do perform a penile prosthesis, I want 
the man to feel completely, and the partner, to feel completely confident of how it works and where the parts are. And so if there is any question or concern, they always ask me, oh, can you see this patient again? The answer is always yes, because at the end of the day is, I need to make sure that you and your partner feel completely confident uh, if we go ahead and, and do this procedure because I want you to know that you always have a supporter, okay? There are sometimes men that come to see me and they say, look, I worked on it, I worked on it, I worked on it, and I can't get it. And then with some ad additional instructions, uh, we're able to, to get there. And so, um, you know, again, at the end of the day is I need to make sure, uh, I need you to know that, I, that I'm always available. And that could be six months down the road, a year down the road, six years down the road. Any questions or concerns, I want whether, whether I perform your prosthesis or somebody else, I want you to know, uh, you know, starting in this room tonight, that I'm always available to be able to help out with that. Sir. Back to the medicines. Sure. Like, uh, Cialis. And yeah. The other, uh, yeah. Viagra, especially Viagra. When they say an empty stomach. Correct. How long is that after you've eaten? Right. So you usually we're really thinking on about about an hour. Okay, because at the end of the day is if you think about absorption, if the goal of the medicine is to absorb into an empty stomach, you really want to make sure the food is passed through. We say that it takes about an hour or so to digest food. Now, obviously, a few crackers is different than, you know, a steak dinner. But at the end of the day is, you know, the first thing we want to find out when a man says, you know, the medications aren't working anymore is to make sure that we're using them correctly. And that also may mean why someone may move from Viagra to Cialis or to another medication because, um, their, you know, uh, how uh, their sexual activity comes may be based on meals and things like that, and we want to make sure that we're not, you know, having to adjust just too much. All right. Yes, ma'am. So after the surgery, how soon can we um, use it? Great question. So at the end of the day is, um, I will say that it takes about four weeks for the penis to fully heal. That is about the time where a man starts feeling confident in understanding the parts of the prosthesis. Okay? So I would say is that with the swelling and with the healing, that already becomes a few weeks of, of, of no training and no, and no, and no touching. Uh, then as you start learning about how the device works, uh, again, at about another, you know, it doesn't take too long to learn it. Uh, another couple weeks or so, uh, we, can, we can get there. And so, you know, I would say for, you know, I would say the average person's probably somewhere between, you know, four and six weeks to be able uh, to start using it. So is that like after he may have had a follow-up? No, I would say from the day of surgery, about four or six weeks, somewhere between, or it's four to, you know, five to six weeks after is where a man uh, who has the swelling gone away and feels confident using it is able to use the device. That's a good question. Okay. Or, oh, I'm sorry, sir. Apologize. Okay. Uh, you said more than likely what's going to fail is going to be the pump. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what's that procedure like? And it doesn't seem like it should be as long as the other one. And right. So I would say is because um, the device, uh, the pump is good for about 10 years, end of the day is, is that we want to make sure that everything works well. So if it's just the pump, then we can fix the pump and it takes about, you know, half an hour or so. If there's any other question that another part of the device may not be working well, then it just makes sense to fix, every, to give, you know, to fix everything you do. And since insurance covers that, as well, we want to make sure, again, when you leave the operating room, as I say, whether you come in with a couple conditions that need to be fixed or you come in with this, and it is, I want you to leave the operating room the best possible. And if that means we need to repair more than just the pump, uh, then that's the case. Now, obviously, there is uh, always uh, a concern that um, with less than 10 years uh, that the pump may give out. And if that's the case and it's just the pump and during the testing we can really focus in on just the pump, then we can fix the pump uh, in a significantly less time. No problem. Yes, sir. I'm not sure why that is, but you said the insurance would cover this procedure. Yeah. But why don't they cover oral medications or injectables? Uh, I don't know. I, uh, I, it just seems odd to me. I, I think that is correct. Uh, all I can say, all I can say, all I can say is uh, right. this is what exists. But uh, I guarantee you, if you want to make a sign and get down to D.C., I'm sure they'd love to see you out there. Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe, maybe Titan gives them a kickback. <laughs> Hold on one second. We're going to get right here. I, I, this is a far-out question. Sure. If, you, if your pump decides it's not going to work yeah. that night, you, don't, you should not run and grab a Viagra, right? 
Well, at the end of the day is the oral medication, injectable medications really won't work because that tissue has been disrupted for that, pro for that prosthesis, okay? Now I'll tell you, unless you know, the pump is broken through the teaching that we're gonna do in the office, you'll know, you know? And so it, it's not, you know, I guess if you had really one too many drinks, you might not be able to, to operate it. But other than that, uh, really, you know, you, you, should, you should know how, how that works for you. So I don't think that will be an issue, but you're right, Dra grabbing a Viagra probably won't be the best chance for you. Yes, ma'am. Um, some insurances pay for some oral medication. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. It's so. just that certain ones they don't pay for. Oh, they Medicare doesn't pay for the fund. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, well, you have to have some other than that because we have Blue Cross and Blue Shield and they pay for ours. Oh, okay. So, like I said, we can all make our signs and, and head down to D.C., but at the end of the day, is i gotta, I got to just talk about what the, what the average is. Um, are there any other questions before we'll just take a, a quick minute break for something? Okay, let's just, uh, we're gonna go ahead and take a, take a break. I'm actually gonna take this uh, microphone off, just stop the camera from there, and then um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to introduce